Tambodidafa, good morning. Thank you for joining me for a daily practice check-in. Listen, listen, listen. This beautiful sound calls us back to our true home. The first mindfulness training. Aware of the suffering caused by the destruction of life, I vow to cultivate compassion and learn ways to protect the lives of people, animals, plants, and minerals. I'm determined not to kill, not to let others kill, and not to condone any act of killing in the world, in my thinking, or in my way of life. <clears throat> A Dharma lesson today is Dealing with Distracting Thoughts from Ajahn Tiradhamma's book, Working with the Five Hindrances. When working with the hindrances, it might also be helpful to keep in mind the Buddha's guidelines for dealing with distracting thoughts, taking into account, of course, the particular context in which we are working, either calm meditation or insight meditation. In one specific discourse, the Buddha gave five methods for dealing with unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, aversion, and delusion, which persistently distract one from the meditation object. The first method is to attend to a more wholesome topic so that the mind may become internally steadied, quieted, brought to singleness, and concentrated. If this does not work, one should examine the disadvantage in those unwholesome thoughts. If the unwholesome thoughts continue to persist, one should try to ignore them, just as one would close one's eyes or look away to avoid seeing some visible object. The fourth method is to calm the thought construct, just as someone who is walking fast would slow down, stand or sit, gradually assuming a more subtle posture. And the final method is to deliberately chase out the unwholesome thoughts just as a strong man would constrain a weaker one. Of course, different thoughts require different methods, so it's important to apply each method with circumspection. My own method in dealing with distracting thoughts is that when one arises, I first just notice it and then go back to the meditation object. If it continues to arise, I look at it more closely to determine what particular kind of distraction it is, then return attention to the meditation object. If the thought persists, I observe whether there is any response in the body and try to experientially investigate further. What is the cause? Is this familiar or is it something new? What is it trying to say? If the distracting thought continues to arise, it is likely to have quite a bit of energy or history to it, that is, it's very likely only the effect of a more detailed and complex casual, uh, causal sequence and may require a more thorough experiential investigation. I then consider how calm the mind is. If the mind is not calmly collected enough, it will easily be pulled into the distractions and any attempt at investigation will remain on a superficial intellectual level. Thus, is a mind calm enough to investigate this phenomenon non-judgmentally. Try it out. If the mind gets pulled in, shaken up, or distur disturbed, it is perhaps better to first increase the level of calm collectedness. If the distraction is overwhelming, this may mean temporarily suspending the meditation exercise by changing postures or even engaging in some other mindful activity until one feels ready to re-engage once again. With mental phenomena, it is generally helpful to bring awareness to the body and, sometimes, feeling tones, to check what the response is. The body is more tangible and slower to change than fleeting, volatile mental activity, and so perhaps easier to access. Also, this helps to fill out the picture of the particular experience, mentally, emotionally, and physically. Likewise, for physical phenomena, 
it is helpful to observe the condition of mind and feeling tones, as well as moods, emotions, and even images, impressions, or associations. <laughs> also, by initially observing the characteristics of a phenomenon, we can determine whether it is energizing or debilitating. It's generally useful to calm energizing phenomenon and energize debilitating ones. The best way to calm them is through the exercises of calm meditation, though sometimes other methods are needed, particularly for the body, for which there are various kinds of breathing exercises and body awareness and relaxation exercises, such as yoga or tai chi. Studying, investigating, and reciting Dhamma teachings can be mentally energizing, and there are many ways to energize the body. Sometimes, general physical energizing is helpful, while at other times, energizing specific parts of the body which manifest symptoms of numbness, frozenness, or immobility is needed. There are also ways to energize gently, for example, certain yoga postures, and ways to energize vigorously. Even if one feels tired afterwards, they may still be useful for getting the blood circulating or shifting energy. May all beings be well, may all beings be happy, may all beings be peaceful. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you for joining me this morning.